The concept of truth is not as straightforward as one might hope, particularly for a concept that seems so clear and self-evident. It's easy enough to say that truth is something that refers to things that are true, but that definition, of course, fails to really define anything. You could say it deals with facts, or it shows us what's really real, and some people in the room might nod their heads in agreement, while others have trouble understanding how you have so much trouble understanding something that is so obvious to them. But what we're really talking about when we talk about truth is not obvious, and that's the problem. There are actually five main and different theories of truth, and they bear the labels coherence theory, correspondence theory, consensus theory, constructivist theory, and pragmatic theory. The coherence theory of truth posits that in order to have truth, you need to be pointing out or defining a piece of a larger coherent system, which is to say something is true because it fits within the realm of, for example, mathematical understanding. We know how math works as a larger system. And identifying truth, then, according to that schema, means that we can take a claim, hold it up to the bigger picture of mathematics, and then identify whether or not it makes sense as part of that grander structure. This theory, unfortunately, is quite limited in scope and doesn't allow you, then, to ascertain the truth of non-quantifiable concerns like psychology and society. Correspondence theory says that something is true if it defines how things actually are in reality. Or put another way, truth is something that exactly expresses objective reality in the most perfect way possible, so that no person could be exposed to this truth and fail to understand what is actually there, what is actually happening, what is actually being portrayed. The issue here is that the perfect communication of quote-unquote real things is probably impossible using the symbols and languages that we have available. And reality is something that is filtered through the perception of the observer, which makes an individual's perceived idea of truth maybe incorrect even before she tries to communicate it. Consensus theory states that truth is whatever the group decides it is, which is to say, if a group, and that group could be a tribe or a city or the entirety of humanity, decides that something is true, then it is. If we all get together and say that a tree is an apple, well, who's to say that it's not? If we all treat that tree as an apple, does that not become the truth? as we understand it. Constructivist theory is predicated on the idea that there are no objective realities and no absolute truths, and that as a consequence, we build, we construct our own truths. We cobble our truths together from our societal norms and conventions and our personal experiences and perceptions our experiences and our backgrounds, then, help us construct our own independent ideas of what is true. And pragmatic theory is a relatively new one that essentially says you can identify truth by putting it into practice. If you believe that an apple will be crisp and juicy, you can put that potential truth to the test by biting into it. Was it crisp? Was it juicy? Now you have the truth. Biting into an apple, then, is a simpler example of what is typically involved in this version of truth-seeking. But more typically, this involves things like scientific inquiry, sociological experimentation, and journalistic investigation. This is an incomplete list of theories about truth, but it contains the five most prominent theories on the subject, at least as of today. 
Some of these, like correspondence theory, are quite old and trace their lineage back to the times even before Plato and Socrates and Aristotle. Others, like that last one, pragmatic theory, are creatures of the 20th century. There are others often called deflationist theories that revolve around the idea that identifying things that are not true can help you trace the outlines of what actually is. While there are still others that are sometimes called pluralist theories, which tether together aspects of several or many other theories to come to a conclusion that they find to be more complete. But whether we're talking theory or concrete reality, the truth is a tricky subject to ascertain or discuss, much less define. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today, the idea of truth, and what happens in a world in which some people have decided that the truth is either something that we cannot ever fully define or something that doesn't matter to begin with. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is brought to you by its wonderful audience, people like you. If you go to letsknowthings.com, you will find an array of different options, different ways that you can contribute to the show if you care to. That can mean direct monetary contribution. That can mean sharing the show with your friends or with your social media. That can mean leaving a review up on iTunes. There are a bunch of different ways to help propagate and perpetuate the show. If you've contributed in some regard already, thank you very, very much, and thanks in advance if you are thinking of doing so in the near future. This episode is also brought to you by HostGator. HostGator is my hosting company of choice for myriad reasons. If you're thinking of starting up a blog, a portfolio, a website for your business, anything online pretty much, it's worth checking out their offerings. And if you go to hostgator.com LKT, you will receive a massive discount on their already excellent prices. This episode is also brought to you by Audible. If you go to audibletrial.com slash LKT, you will receive a free month of Audible and an audiobook of your choice from their collection, which you can keep whether or not you stick with them past that initial month. It's a great way to get into the audiobook scene if it is something that you have been eyeing with trepidation from the sidelines. A bunch of my books are on there. There are a few hundred thousand books of all shapes and sizes and genres. And if you are lacking a way to spend that free credit, stick around to the end of this episode and I will suggest a book for you to check out. All right, let's get back to the show. The topic of today's episode is one that I've been mulling over for quite some time, and I've even mentioned it in somewhat abstract ways on past episodes, but it's something that I've been trying to figure out the right way to talk about, because it's a vitally important issue, but it's also something that when we discuss it, it's easy to get bogged down by unimportant side paths rather than sticking to the main thoroughfare and reaching the real meat of the issue. And it's so easy to get derailed in that way because there are so many different paths, so many different tentacles that are splaying off this main topic of how we produce and consume information and what we are talking about when we talk about truth and reality even to a certain degree. And this has been brought to the forefront of public consciousness in particular right now because of the confluence of what's happening within media as a whole, within journalism more specifically, and within politics and how the media and journalism is covering politics. And this is something that's happening all over the world and has been happening all over the world, but it has really hit a fever pitch right now because of the series of elections that have happened across the free world, across the democratic world where we have elections, and because of the technologies that have been relatively recently introduced into the media sector and that have been 
in big ways and small, adjusting the way that we consume information and how we feel about that information. So that in mind, the story that I want to start with today comes from the Washington Post. And the article is entitled, The Post-Truth World of the Trump Administration is Scarier Than You Think. And I picked this article a little bit hesitantly because I, I didn't want to start out with a strong slant. And this is absolutely a very slanted article. But I think it's important to have a slant in this area. Because to me, the discussion is not about this candidate versus this candidate. It's more about how we disseminate information and how we decide what is truth and what is not truth. And in this particular circumstance, at this period in time, there is a very clear delineation, at least in defining who it is that is trying to Shanghai the truth, who's trying to sabotage the idea of concrete reality. And then everyone else is on the other side of that to varying degrees, either trying to uphold truth or trying to Shanghai it in a much less capable way, doing a much worse job of it, if that is in fact what they're trying to do. When we talk about post-truth in this way, what we're really discussing is the remarkable propensity for the Trump administration and those who have rallied around him to completely dismiss the concept of an objective truth. And in some cases, using those actual words, clearly stating outright that there is no absolute truth, and sometimes implying it through their statements and their actions in ways that we haven't seen, at least not in the United States before. It's important to remember that politicians lie. An argument could be made that lying is actually part of what politicians do for a living. They tell happy, friendly lies that make constituents comfortable and international counterparts pliable. That's kind of the nature of the political game in a lot of ways. And yes, there is a lot more that goes into it, but it's safe to say that the compulsive truth tellers in the political sphere are few and far between. It would be very difficult to identify a single one, I would imagine. And this is part of the appeal of someone like Trump who claims that they will speak truth to power, that they are not politically correct, that they're not afraid to sound racist or sexist, that they're going to tell it like it is, that they are not going to be silenced or muffled by the people who are trying to keep the truth tellers from stating the truth as they see it. And this is something that Trump has claimed from the beginning, that this is what he does, that he is the voice of those who feel stifled in terms of what they can say and what they can do. And as I mentioned, this type of dismissal of objective truth is not something that we've really seen in this way in the U.S. before, but we have seen it elsewhere and approaching the topic in a very similar way. You can look to the Philippines, to President Rodrigo Duterte. He came into power with a similar flamboyance and I'll say what I want to say attitude to that which Trump has used. And Jean-Marie Le Pen in France, there are similar characters in the Netherlands and in Austria. The Brexit in Britain brought a slew of new far-right politicians into power who utilized this same, we're from the outside and therefore we will do right by you type of attitude. While characters like Hugo Chavez of Venezuela and Evo Morales in Bolivia have long held sway in Latin America with the same type of tough guy speaking truth to power type of brand. Now these countries, these groups of people who are under these types of strongman leadership characters, they all have the right to make choices for themselves. I mean, that's the whole concept of elections, of democracy. Policies and perspectives and common opinion, they all ebb and flow. And they'll often push hard in one direction and then in the other, the next election. And then maybe they'll maunder around in the center for a bit before being riled up once more in one direction or the other. That's how the process works. The concern here, which I have and which I believe is shared by many people right now, is not about these individual groups and these individual sentiments that these particular groups and strongmen candidates hold. 
it's that when you hamstring the concept of the truth itself and our ability to have a concrete truth, something that tethers us to reality, you also potentially eliminate the possibility for future change, the ability to move away from a choice that was made at one moment in time by one group of people in order to make way for something new, something else, something that is more relevant to the times and changing opinions. This ability to change and stay dynamic is what allows us to continue to evolve as societies, morally and everything else. Having a concept of truth and a respect for facts is what has kept politicians who lie for a living from taking more, from taking further, more dramatic advantage of the system. Just as journalism is kept in check by an internal and external system of checks and balances, where everyone is watching everyone else to make sure that they are telling truths and have all the data, and that if anyone pulls anything that proves to be false, they get called out on it. Politicians are also watched, and more closely than almost anyone else. If they step out of line, we can kind of crush them in a lot of different ways. And that's how it should be. These politicians themselves have power that we have bequeathed them and that we trust them with. And it's only right that there should be a series of big red buttons that we not-so-powerful people can push if something goes wrong, if they prove to be not worthy of that power that they have been given. If any of these politicians pull a Watergate, then we want to be able to pull the reins of power from their hands. That is why a system like democracy works as well as it does. It's absolutely not perfect, particularly the way that it is practiced in many parts of the world, the United States very much included, but it is way better than all the other models that we've tried. And the loss of or reduction of facts in the public eye to a lesser status is the first step in taking away these big red buttons that we have. To make us question the very idea of truth and the ability to have a concrete truth is to make us question our reality so that someone else can step in and tell us what is real. The power that this gives other people cannot be overstated. It is what has allowed for the mass atrocities in places like the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany and many, many other places throughout history. If a leader can simply deny that horrible things are happening and expect that people will either believe them, despite all evidence to the contrary, or will not speak up because there is no way to present contradictory evidence or connect that bit of evidence that they have with other facts, then there's nothing that anyone can do to stop that leader. There's nothing then that that leader can't get away with. And without these checks on their power, without the ability to show that they are doing things that they are doing, and presented in a forum that then has the possibility to lead to them losing some of that power, there is nothing that that leader cannot get away with. And history has shown over and over again that when those who crave power have free reign in that way, they will almost always abuse it in creative and horrifying ways. Among these concerns, among these potential abuses, is the possibility that these leaders, as they so often do, will remove the possibility of themselves ever being replaced in the future. In the post-fact reality that they present, there will always be a new emergency that requires that they stay in office for a bit longer, or a criminal act committed by their political opponents that give them the right to hold on to all that power and jail anyone who opposes them. This is how authoritarianism works. First, you remove the public's ability to fact-check and to do anything about you accumulating more power. Then you tell as many lies as you want, building up a reality in which it makes sense for you to maintain perpetual ironclad control. I'm aware as I say these things that it sounds very alarmist, but this is the root of a conversation that's happening in the news right now. And to be perfectly honest, I am, I'm a bit torn about the larger conversation. On one hand, 
There has not been a president in modern history, and perhaps all of U.S. history, who hasn't been compared to foreign dictators or historical tyrants in the minds and propaganda of their political opponents. George W. Bush was Hitler, and Obama was some Middle Eastern wannabe caliph, and if Hillary was elected, I'm certain someone would have come up with a suitably insulting comparison along that vein as well. And so when we see these comparisons and these warning flares, I can't help but become more than a little skeptical, because we've heard this story before. Was this person's administration really, really bad in some ways? Maybe, yeah. Was it also good in some ways? Probably. I think we could probably say the same of every single administration, if we're being honest with ourselves, that there are good and bad things. And what defines those good and bad things is probably delineated by our respective political party. And each and every time we've done this, it has not been the end of the world. It was never the end of the democratic system that largely defines the United States and many other countries throughout the world today. On the other hand, my antenna does go up anytime someone takes power or prominence, in part by messing with our basis of communication and understanding. Having people who disagree with you and everything you stand for absolutely sucks, but it is the nature of the beast that is democracy. We are all going to feel like winners about half the time and feel like we are living under a hell beast the other half. But to have someone start tearing that system apart is a very different thing altogether. It's one thing to play chess, for example, against someone who plays dirty. Maybe they use brazen, untested contemporary strategies, and you believe that the classic moves are the only correct ones. That is a difference of opinion and tactics, and it might be frustrating, but it's what you signed up for. It's a very different situation when your opponent decides that their pieces move in different ways. Their knight piece can now teleport anywhere on the board, and their king is protected by a force field, and they can knock over the board anytime they like, and that means that they win. Some people might applaud this upset, this embarrassment of a system that they might not consider to be fair. Maybe they don't play chess particularly well under these well-established rules that everyone else is using. So seeing those rules mistreated and abused and dismissed is good fun to those particular people. But to have someone play the game in this way and then see them rise up the ranks of chess tournaments and then seeing that person crowned best chess player in the world is something that makes you question the whole game a little bit. Maybe you even start to wonder if the whole thing is even relevant anymore. A recent study by the World Values Survey shows that 17% of Americans today think that democracy is a bad way to run a country. That's up from 9% in the 1990s. And that same study shows that one in six U.S. citizens believes that army rule of the country, that's rule by the military rather than by elected politicians, would be a fairly good or very good thing. This is a trend that's more prominent among young people, potential voters aged 18 to 24 in particular, and I think there's a lot of reason for that, frankly. If you look at the way that modern American democracy is set up, it's difficult not to see the flaws and all the cracks in our system. I personally still believe that it's way better than the alternatives that we have on the table that we see elsewhere. But there are a lot of good arguments as to why it's not something we should just tacitly support, why it's not something that we should validate even by participating in it. I know a lot of smart people from all age demographics who do not vote because they don't believe their vote matters and because they can't morally justify casting a vote in favor of a politician that they do not actually believe in, that they don't believe will do anything to change the weak, slanted structure that our politics are built upon. They don't even want to implicitly support someone who has emerged from within what they consider to be a very tainted and corrupt system. There is some truth in this, I think. 
A lot of people voted for Hillary Clinton in the most recent 2016 election. And as more ballot counts roll in, it's increasingly clear that she won a fairly substantial popular vote victory over Donald Trump. This win of the popular vote for her puts on display the double issue of one, that the candidate with more votes does not necessarily win the presidential election, and two, that the candidate who won the most votes was not exactly an enthusiasm-inducing option for many of the people who voted for her. Yes, she was an incredibly experienced, incredibly competent politician, and yes, she knew the system inside and out, perhaps more so than any candidate in modern history, but those attributes, commonly thought to be assets, were actually seen by many people this election season to be liabilities. That she emerged as the top choice from a population of other capable politicians seemed a bit like being the number one criminal in a prison ward. Yes, it's notable to be the dominant player in any space, but do we really want to support someone who's the best at that? The best at being a scummy, corrupt politician? At lying and cheating and stealing? At stabbing people in the back and being a bureaucrat who keeps things from actually getting done? At talking a big game and then never actually doing anything? At fixing anything? The best at spending her life accumulating power and then abusing it in all kinds of ways, primarily to accumulate more power? Who would want to support such a person? Who would want to put any of these creeps, any of these politicians at the top of our pyramid? And thus, as a partial consequence of not wanting to put someone that they perceive to be a corrupt criminal, power-seeking sociopath in power, we have elected well, a corrupt criminal power-seeking sociopath, but not one that emerged from the world of politics, one that emerged from the world of a very specific facet of the business world, one that was just far enough offstage that his life and dealings were less well autopsied than his opponent, and his politics were less well understood, and so they could be painted and branded in any way he might see fit. Much has been made this election cycle about the failings of political polls to accurately capture what was happening amongst the voting populace. Think pieces and hit pieces, and a whole lot of clearly not thinking too hard pieces have been written on the subject. This is a microcosm of what's happening within the world of journalism as a whole, but more interesting in some ways, I think, because there are actual numbers involved with polls. And the concept of getting things right or wrong seems a little less subjective as a consequence of that. It's important to note from the outset that most people do not actually understand probability. When a pollster says there's a 99% chance of something happening, of a person getting elected, that does not mean that thing will happen. It means that it's very likely to happen but there is still a 1% chance of that thing not happening. And if that 1% comes true, that pollster was still correct. But because this feels counterintuitive, the world's pollsters were just lambasted post-election because of their near-universal predictions that Trump would lose, perhaps by a substantial margin. At some points during the election, Probably the most well-known conglomeration of polls, that of 538, had the probability of a Clinton victory hovering somewhere in the 80 to 85% range. As a result of this, even Trump's people, when he won the election, were caught a bit off guard. The numbers had seemed so certain that he would lose. How did this happen? That was the question on everyone's mind in tongues and printing presses the next day. In the aftermath, some claimed to have been prescient about this, pointing to moments when they questioned the dominant storyline, while others went into full self-flagellation mode, criticizing themselves and their newspaper and their industry and their methods. Some were even questioning the veracity and meaningfulness of the very work that they do for a living. They were wondering what the point of it all might be, of all that effort, of all those resources spent if they can't even get something like an election right. The problem to me isn't the polls. 
If you look at them and understand what's being said, most of them were not wrong, or not very wrong at least. Despite all the sticks that have been thrown in journalistic spokes over the course of the campaign by both parties, a 20% chance of a Trump victory is still a substantial chance, and him winning with such a number in place does not mean the polls are wrong. What's wrong is how we came to view and use these polls. Because by the end of this election, by the end of the 2016 presidential election season, these polls had become entertainment. They were shaping how people felt throughout the day. When Clinton was way up, you could feel the celebratory certitude in the liberal-leaning internet sphere and detect the underdogism that was emanating from the Trump fold. Entire new sub-industries grew around this data. Entire facets of the podcasting world, some of them making up a huge portion of overall listeners to the medium, by the way, were invented to provide day-to-day -day coverage of this information, of the polls and what's happening around them. Entirely new talking head careers were born, and new revenue streams were identified, and new influence flags were planted in the ground. It all became a horse race, with people wanting to know any time the probabilities shifted by even a percentage point, and wanting to hear political, in some cases quote-unquote experts, in some cases real experts, tease that change apart over the course of a half hour or a 45 minute ad-sponsored program. This, in tandem with other aspects of the campaign, made the whole process seem to go on forever. It was difficult to escape from. It dominated our attention. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with being civilly engaged, but what we were engaging with wasn't actionable data. It was a collection of numbers predicated on demographic surveys, historical context, and a large amount of guesswork. The people behind these polls were clever in how they concocted their end product, but that end product wasn't useful in any specific way on a day-to-day -day basis. It didn't give us information that we needed to vote. It didn't inform us of policy or make us aware of pressing issues. It was pure and simple entertainment not education, and yet we were treating it as education, when all it was was a constant reshuffling and displaying of tarot cards, an act that purports to be prophecy, but in reality is only really useful for recreational purposes. There's something similar playing out in journalism as a whole, I think. Business models are requiring more and more eyeballs, and that means keeping emotion fires stoked in the hearts of viewers and listeners and readers. And doing that requires, at times, sacrificing the act of reporting facts in favor of, well, something else. It's been a difficult decade or so for journalistic entities of all flavors, as their infrastructure and their operating procedures, not to mention their channels of communication, and even their internal culture, have been upended by the internet and other related technologies. At this point, most of the bigger and a whole lot of the smaller and more nimble newspapers, magazines, websites have figured out how this new landscape operates in general, but change is still churning within their ranks, and a lot of what's happening is the result of razor-thin margins and a steadily decreasing population in the press room. The result of all this is more clickbait, less news. This is something that I've talked about at greater length in the past on an older episode of the podcast called Click. But in short, the modern economics of journalism incentivizes purveyors of news to share smaller bits of news and faster across different channels and with different slants. Now, briefer, more concise news is not inherently bad, but that skew on the news is something that often tilts the information more toward what could generously be called infotainment, where maybe there are facts presented, but those facts are encircled by or intertwined by a buzzing web of talking heads and shouting matches and speculation and ill-informed efforts to balance arguments for which there is no legitimate other side. 
I would argue that some of these steps are positive ones when done right, that good editorials are valuable and can drive home the importance of something happening in the world around us, to which we might not have otherwise given proper attention and credence. But that said, a little sugar in your medicine is only helpful if it makes that medicine more palatable, without producing more damage than the medicine cures. A pill that is served alongside a pound of sugar is a net negative for the person who consumes it, and we find ourselves precariously close to that sort of situation when engaging with a lot of news networks today. The diminishment of fact in favor of entertainment is part of why it's right here, right now, so easy to dismiss the press as a bunch of no-good ninnies who only ever get things wrong and are always supporting the wrong candidate and who are well-coiffed elites looking to work their way up the ladder rather than hard-nosed reporters with their eyes on the truth and a penchant for exposing difficult information held by powerful people. This perception of them, then, is part of why they're such easy targets for demagogues like Trump. A demagogue, by the way, is a, quote, political leader who seeks support by appealing to popular desires and prejudices rather than by using rational argument, end quote. Part of Trump's power is that he was able to rile up emotions in his listeners, giving as few concrete details as possible and instead relying on a widespread disdain for the structures upon which the American system of governance, as currently practiced, is predicated. That means the political elites are the bad guys. The people trying to educate us about the system are the bad guys. And yes, that means the journalists reporting this stuff are the bad guys. If they were not the bad guys, the argument goes, they would have changed things a long time ago. If they weren't the bad guys, we wouldn't have found ourselves in such a bad situation today. Now, the truth of whether or not we're actually in a bad situation is something that is highly debatable, in part because it is so incredibly subjective. Yes, things have gotten worse for a certain portion of the electorate, which is something that can be said for every span of time at any point in history in any country on the planet. But telling those people that their experience is the experience of everyone, except those bad people who are the enemy who are doing this to them, is a useful way to rally the troops. And just as Fox News did starting around the time of the Iraq war, inflaming passions by giving an emotionally engaged collection of people a common enemy and a common cause is a great way to not just get viewers, but also, it turns out, to turn out voters. And this is, by the way, why demagogues have been so successful historically. And demagoguery is a big part of why having systems of checks and balances are so vital. It's why a strong, respected press is so vital. Because they tend to be the ones to catch demagogues before they achieve power or to topple them once they do. Demagogues find it convenient to sidestep truth because it allows them to shape the reality of their followers. A well-informed electorate tends not to be taken in by demagogues because they recognize the mistruth of what's being said, and in turn, are not emotionally entangled in the message that is being purveyed. Intentionally spreading misinformation is not a new tactic, but it's one that's taken on a new sheen, a new look, in the age of the internet, in the age of social media. Today, it's easier than ever to spread misinformation and to have it presented with the same implied integrity as real, fact-based news to a public who isn't savvy enough to know the difference. It's tempting in this kind of situation to crave some kind of consequence, some kind of law, for instance, that makes fake news illegal, that would put the hammer down on those who are making such fake news and to legislate sites like Facebook, whose algorithms are one of the biggest distributors of this fake news. And I'll admit, as someone who is worried about the integrity of the press being critically harmed, these types of thoughts have crossed my mind. But I do worry that taking any steps in that direction would not actually solve the problem and would instead destroy the very things that we hope to protect with our system. Part of what's valuable about having a democracy is the freedom of speech. 
And taking that away is not something that should be taken lightly. To take away the freedom of speech to protect democracy is a bit like killing someone to prevent violence. Yes, you've stopped something bad from happening, but haven't you given up part of what you're trying to protect in the trade-off? It's also important to recognize that these sorts of laws are exactly the kind of thing that authoritarian rulers put into place when they take office to help them cripple the flow of legitimate information. We could pass a law today saying that fake news is banned and that anyone found to be publishing it will be sued or jailed. But if someone whose interests lie in keeping information that isn't biased in their favor from the public were to then take power, they could use those same laws to crush what they would perceive as enemy propaganda. And they could use it to jail legitimate journalists and sue their newspapers and magazines and websites into oblivion. This is not a speculative concern. This is something that has happened over and over again around the world. And so this is something that we probably have to handle from a different angle. The issue of ensuring that we as a people can remain informed is important. And we do need to be able to make decisions based on real, actual facts, rather than simply responding to clever tugs on our emotions. If we elect people based on facts, then we know what we're getting ourselves into, and we have the whole picture available. If we elect people based on emotion and faux reality, then we put someone into power who has not only inflamed those emotions in us, taking advantage of us, but we have also elected them under a premise of surreality, which means they can, if they wish, create a continuous stream of misinformation and emergencies that further empower them, reducing the chances that we'll ever get the power to make changes to the system again. And this is true of anyone who would enter office, whether it's someone like Trump or Clinton or a third party. It is a very valid concern that someone vying for higher office would utilize any tools available to them to try to pull up the ladder behind them. It is of vital importance, governmentally and philosophically, to ensure that we are able to keep changing and growing. That is is the whole point of the system, uncomfortable as it can be sometimes. And to do that, we probably need to recalibrate our focus toward ensuring that we have a concrete reality to base our choices on and ensure that our public is educated and informed and not making decisions from a place of weakness or perceived weakness. And that probably means that we will need to figure out ways to solve some of the fundamental issues that plague facets of our society so that the citizenry who are making these decisions, and hopefully continue to make these decisions in the future, can make them from a place of calm, from a place of security, rather than feeling like they are voting from a foxhole. Now, how all of this happens, I have no idea. I hesitate to place all the responsibility in the hands of the journalists and other information distributors of today, because they, in turn gain much of their power from public approval and government protection. And so there's a lot of different entities involved in this system. And if any of them drift away or fail to do their job, then we lose the security of that entire protective mesh. I do think that non-journalists, people like podcasters, for instance, and the myriad talking heads that we have seen come to prominence of late, will have an increasing role to play in this. If presented correctly, information that's disseminated in this way can be super valuable, and it can, if nothing else, help people respect the factual information that's coming their way as well and see it as valuable rather than threatening. Maybe it'll be a simple matter of ensuring that people can tell the difference between a news report and a commentator. Maybe it's about the algorithms and distribution systems favoring demonstrable facts and entities known to make use of them over blatant lies and clear propaganda, though much of that still falls prey to the filter bubbles that surround us, so tagging and prioritizing alone may not be enough. Probably it'll be a mix of these solutions and many others that we maybe haven't even identified yet. It'll also be a matter of systematically identifying the influences and variables that are causing the system to 
become more brittle and full of cracks rather than remaining fluid and malleable. Maybe we'll have to come up with ways to remind ourselves regularly that the discomfort that we feel with our system and with the people we share it with but with whom we disagree, that that's a feature, not a bug. It's what makes the whole thing work. And maybe part of what we'll need to do is figure out new viable ways to have conversations and compare notes without tearing each other's heads off without labeling anyone who disagrees with an extreme polarized version of our politics as the other and relegating them to outsider or evil status. There was a news item that hit the web just as I was about to record this episode about a man who walked into a well-known family pizza restaurant in Washington, D.C. with a gun, with several guns and other weapons. Now, reports at the moment are saying that, thankfully, no one was hurt, but What caused this man to bring his weaponry into this family establishment was a piece of false and easily debunked news that is now being referred to as Pizzagate. The premise of this storyline is that there's an online conspiracy theory that members of the Clinton administration are running a child sex slave business out of the back rooms of this family restaurant, and no one is doing anything about it because everyone is corrupt. A quick sniff test of this conspiracy identifies it as clearly false, and a more thorough look makes it seem even more ridiculous. But this man and his guns raided the place because he firmly believes that children were being abused there. He was given this information by various entities with megaphones on the internet, and people like Michael Flynn, who is a retired general that Trump has had advising him on issues of national security, has been sharing stories like this alongside many others that have also been debunked. And this is another common tactic of demagogues, by the way. Trump made excellent use of this tactic all throughout his candidacy. He retweeted conspiracies and other mistruths so that he could get that information out there and pollute the airwaves, while still being able to say that he never said any of these things. He himself is not making these claims. He is fond of saying during his speeches that some people are saying blah 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 when he has something that is clearly false that he wants to plant in the news and get into the discussion. In some cases, there actually are other people saying these things. In other cases, it's completely fabricated. The real drag here is that a lot of the people who are being riled up by these false messages really do have their hearts in the right place. I mean, imagine, if you will, that you have just received information that children are being systematically sold into slavery and abused by people in power. And these people are so high up that they are running for the country's highest office, one of the most powerful positions in the world, and they are getting away with this casual abuse of children, just miles away from where you live. What wouldn't you do to stop something like that? And if you had the means to go in and physically stop this thing, like forcibly find evidence or even permanently stop the child sex slavers with a bullet, might that not seem like a valid option? That is the lens through which we should view this problem. Because although most conspiracies are clearly vapor, some of them actually end up being true. I mean, Watergate, it sounded crazy. If you've ever read or watched All the President's Men, you know that this was a story that no one wanted to touch. Because it just seemed so far out. And the people involved all had to be incredibly careful about what they said and how they presented it. Because it sounded totally nuts. And if they presented it in any other way than how they did, they would have lost their legitimacy forever. And I mean, that's good. That's how it should be. Extraordinary claims should require extraordinary evidence. But it also means that the pollution of these information channels keeps us from understanding which information is legit and actionable, and which is clear BS that catalyzes another Pizzagate. And the unfortunate fact is that many people, right now in particular, but also in general, are incredibly gullible when it comes to ascertaining what's real and what's fiction. And this is not because they're dumb, it's just because most people are so focused on other things, on their day-to-day, 
that the intricacies of politics and law and science and even some aspects of like reality are not priorities. And as a result, that sniff test to see whether something is even in the realm of possibility is off kilter. We don't all smell the same things because we don't all have the same worldview informed by the same information. And the flatter and more focused a person's worldview, the more likely they are to receive information and fail to realize that, hey, this doesn't actually make any sense. Or at least if it's going to make sense, I'm going to need a hell of a lot more proof than a claim posted on Twitter and amplified on Reddit and retweeted by a demagogue. We don't need or necessarily even really want to maintain the status quo. We should keep changing and shatter convention at times. We need to replace the guard and challenge authority as frequently as it makes sense to do so. But we need to do this in a way that ensures change can continue to be made in the future. Delegitimizing facts, and within our system that means delegitimizing journalism and other checks and balances, and also knowledge about fundamental realities like science, is one of the quicker and more certain ways to demolish our chances to keep evolving in the future. It removes our ability to change the guard in the future, because the people who are in control have eliminated our means of understanding why we should, and have taken away our ability to act even if we do decide that it's worthwhile. Whatever the future holds, and whatever politician takes office next, I think we will all feel a lot better about it if we can be certain that each administration, each reign of a particular group of power holders, will not be the last. They will not last forever. It's heartening to know that any damage that they can do can be undone by the next group that takes office, and any approaches and stances and regulations and rules that we as a society try on for size can be discarded just as easily as we change and hopefully grow for the better as a people. This episode and every episode of Let's Know Things is brought to you by you, the listener. If you go to letsnotethings.com, you will see a bunch of different ways that you can contribute. Everything from like a one-off monetary contribution to setting up a monthly payment to sharing with your friends to leaving a review on iTunes. These are all incredibly valuable means of contributing, and I appreciate every single one of them. A huge thanks to everyone who has contributed already, and a preemptive thanks if you are thinking of doing so in the future. This episode is brought to you by Audible. If you go to audibletrial.com slash LKT, you'll receive a free month of Audible and an audiobook of your choice. If you are short on ideas of what to use that Audible credit for, might I suggest The Forever War, a wonderful work of fiction by Joe Haldeman. This is a piece of military science fiction written back in 1974, and it involves kind of a military expedition a vast distance away through space, kind of a revenge expedition against a group of aliens. But the real uniqueness and novelty of this novel is how it dealt with the idea of isolation and alienation from one's own culture. Because of the effects of time dilation, when these soldiers go back home after this war that is you know, a vast distance away, their home has changed. Even if it's only been a few years for them, the soldiers, it's been a great deal more time for the people back on Earth. And so dealing with that type of alienation is something that isn't often brought up in the futuristic military epics, but it, it absolutely is, and to great effect in this novel. It was written by a guy who actually was in the Vietnam War, and there's a lot of parallels there. And those parallels are continued throughout the series, actually. This is the first book in a three-book series. All three are worth checking out. This is my favorite of them. The Forever War by Joe Haldman. And you can snag this for free on Audible if you go to audibletrial.com slash LKT. But it is also worth grabbing if you want to pick it up at your local library, get it at your local indie bookstore, grab it on your Kindle, your Kobo, or any other means that you have of getting your hands on books. This one is very much worth your time and attention. This episode is also brought to you by HostGator. 
HostGator is the hosting company that I have very gladly used for many years now. Whether you are building a blog or a website for your business or a portfolio site of some kind, they have excellent options for all shapes and sizes of projects. Go to HostGator.com LKT and you will receive a special discount that they are providing to listeners of Let's Know Things. That is HostGator.com LKT. You can find the show notes for this episode and every episode at letsnotethings.com. There you can also sign up for the Let's Note Things weekly newsletter, which contains an assortment of links to interesting things, and that is 100% free. I just like to share interesting things with people. You can find Let's Note Things on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook at Let's Know Things, and you can find me, the host, Colin Wright, at Colin is my name, pretty much everywhere on the internet. You can find a list of books that I have written at colin.io, and my blog is at exilelifestyle.com. Thank you so very much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week.